look at today is we're going to have a look at uh, what I call humanity's hidden history, which is the history of humanity that uh, we normally don't think about and normally haven't been told about. Uh, the whole purpose of the lecture that I have is to really make you open your eyes and perhaps question everything that we think we know about uh, humanity and civilization. It's not Christmas themed. I was going to wear a Santa hat the whole time to make it sort of Christmas themed, but the dancing elves. And there's no dancing elves. So let's start off by having a look at the brief timeline, timeline sorry, of civilization as our modern understanding. Okay, so this is what's taught in most of the world's schools. This is what most of the, the scientists and everything agree on. So we go all the way back to about 400,000 to 250,000 BC. That's when Homo sapiens first appear on the African continent. Okay, so this is as far as we traced our humanity all the way back, starts about 400,000 to 250,000 BC, where we start to see humanity appearing on the African continent. Then about 50,000 BC, that's the end of the Ice Age, and that's when uh, Homo sapiens, basically our ancestors, begin to move out of Africa. Okay, so we're confined to Africa because of the, the Ice Age and the temperatures there, the Ice Age disappears, and then humanity starts to spread out of Africa. Around about 2000, sorry, around about 10,000 BC, that's where we cross the Bering Strait up near Alaska and start to then move down into North and then South America. So we start in Africa, we spread up from Africa into Europe, go across through Russia, down through the Bering Strait in Alaska, and into North and then South America. Around 8,500 to 7,500 BC, that's when we start to see the first signs of agriculture and animal husbandry. Okay, so that's when we start to see that humanity is no longer running around chasing animals. They've decided to raise them and keep them close to them. And the same thing, rather than going out foraging for nuts and berries in the woods, humanity figures, hey, if I plant some nuts and berries right here, then I don't have to go running around as much. Then about 3,500 BC, that's the first civilization. Okay, that's as the earliest records that we have of a large group of humans living together. And of course, that was the cradle of civilization uh, near the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and that's the Mesopotamian and Sumerian civilizations. We've probably heard about them before. So we're going all the way back to Babylonia, Mesopotamia, Sumeria. So roughly about 5,500 years previous to where we are right now. That was the first signs of humanity living in a collective, large group, working together. You know, people would, people would farm, some people would have different trades and skills, they'd barter and that kind of stuff. Shortly after that, we see the Egyptian civilization. So the common understanding uh, is about 3,300 BC. That's where the Egyptian civilization first began. Uh, about 3,000 BC, that's where we first start to see written records. That's cuneiform writing, which is a really basic style of writing, just a, a series of lines. So basically about 5,000 years ago is when the first time we actually have written communication and written records, if we're to assume that all this is correct. 2500 BC, that's the next largest civilization, that's the Indus River Civilization, that's basically the Indian subcontinent. Uh, about 1800 BC, that's where civilization began in China, around the Yangtze River. Uh, 1000 BC is the time that we're supposed to accept that the Mayan civilization began. 750 BC are the Greeks. Shortly after that, 500 BC is the Romans. And uh, there's us at the end. 2010. Okay? I skipped a couple years at the end there, right? I like the us. So this is, the, this is a very brief timeline, obviously, but this is what uh, modern science tells us. This is the history of civilization right there. It all fits on one slide. Okay, basically, so we go back about 400,000 years, and those are kind of the big milestones. So if we assume this is correct, then basically what we're being told is the first civilization didn't begin until about five to 6,000 years ago. That's not really a long time. Before then, before we lived as civilizations, most of humanity lived a, a nomadic or tribal existence. So we lived as small tribes, more like small families, or we wandered around as a nomadic band of hunters and gatherers. That was before we became into a large cohesive civilization. And of course, the first time we saw that was apparently Babylonian Samaria about 5,500 years ago. 
Another interesting thing when we look at the history of humanity, the current theories that we have also state that when we go back six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 years ago, we see a very primitive humanity. We see primitive technologies and we see simple tools. The idea being that humanity slowly became more technologically advanced in a linear fashion until modern times. So we were running around with sticks and clubs, and then we figured out if you put a pointy end on the stick, then it would be a better weapon. Then we figured out if you made the weapon out of something harder, then we would get a sword. This kind of technological advancement was preceded in a linear fashion. That's what we're to believe when we look at all those earlier civilizations. There's no way they could be as technically advanced as we were. Okay, when you go back 10,000 years, we're running around, you know, naked in the woods with a big stick is basically what we're supposed to believe. For example, one of the things that's commonly stated, which I'm sure you've heard before, is the Mayan civilization, as great as they were, it said that they didn't even have use of the wheel. They hadn't even invented the wheel yet. Never mind that they're building giant megalithic structures and pyramids. They supposedly didn't have access to any technology and didn't even have access to the wheel. <clears throat> if our ancestors then were only able to use basic primitive technology and tools, why do we still not know how they accomplished such feats as building the pyramids and other megalithic structures? Okay, for example, Stonehenge. We have no idea how they moved the rocks. We have no idea how they made them. We say that humanity is only this old, and all we have for technology proceeded in this fashion, so when we go back into history, we have no idea, because it doesn't fit that model. Megaliths don't fit the model that we understand about humanity. There's two terms I'm going to introduce to you. The first term is anachronism. And an anachronism is an inconsistency in some chronological arrangement, especially a chronological misplacing of persons, events, objects, or customs in regard to each other. You could think of an anachronism as a representation of something existing or occurring other than its proper time in history. So we have this accepted model of how our humanity went. Anything that deviates from that model, we term an anachronism. And another important term to look at when we start talking about the history of humanity is something that's referred to as an out-of-place artifact. <coughs> an out-of-place artifact is an object of historical, archaeological, or paleontological interest found in a very unusual or seemingly impossible context that challenges the conventional historic chronology. So an out-of-place artifact is something that's discovered that doesn't fit our accepted timeline of humanity. Okay, so basically for the rest of this lecture, all we're going to do is look at anachronisms and out-of-place artifacts in an attempt to challenge the uh, conventionally accepted model of the history of our civilization. So if we go back to the idea that the earliest civilization didn't begin until about 5,000 years ago, and if we assume that humanity when they started was basically a primitive, simple culture, then if we accept all that, why does there exist things like primitive carvings of humans and dinosaurs together? Why does there exist fossilized human footprints found alongside dinosaur tracks? Why then does there exist pyramids, roads, and buildings in underwater areas that haven't been above water in over 12,000 years? Why does there exist batteries and other complicated mechanical devices that are thousands of years old? Why do there exist Egyptian hieroglyphics depicting helicopters and other machines? Why does there exist human tools found embedded in rock and coal? Knowing that rock and coal, we're talking ages now, millions of years old. Why do we find human artifacts embedded in rock and coal? Why do we have examples of advanced metallurgy from thousands of years old? Okay, metal compositions that we can't replicate today, or that just recently in the last 20 or so years, we're understanding the composition of the metals and the unique properties that they have. So let's have a look at some of these things. Uh, this is something that you might not have actually heard before. Hidden beneath the waters off Okinawa, Japan, lies one of the greatest mysteries of archaeology that, curiously enough, is also something that not a lot of people are aware of. There's majestic stone structures, temples, giant compounds lying beneath 60 to 100 feet of water. Okay, things like stone terraces, right angled stone blocks and walls, stone circles encompassing hexagonal columns, stone platforms and blocks with what appear to be post holes. So very clearly, man-made structures lying beneath the water. The whole structure itself has a road which circles it, and the road 
encircles an area which encompasses eight separate sites. So obviously the remains of some sort of a, a small town or civilization. Uh, here's some pictures of it. It's a popular diving site, by the way. Many people go and dive there. Um, you can see these are some of the, the terraced walls on the sides right there. There's a couple of divers exploring the site. Uh, here's some more pictures. You can see the complexity of the actual stonework that's done there. Uh, there's some more, a bit of a, a wall, a, a temple compound. All this stuff is lying under the water just off of Japan. Who's heard of this before, just out of curiosity? Yeah, hardly anybody ever hears about this stuff, which is, is kind of a, a curious thing, given that it's a comparable site to something like the pyramids or Stonehenge. The only exception, of course, is it's underwater. Uh, there are structures with similar architecture found on land nearby <coughs> Japan. So if you go to Japan, the Okinawa area, you can see temples and other stone structures that are basically the same as what's underneath the water, suggesting that the people that built them were the same people that built the ones underwater as well. The catch, the paradox that lies here is the underwater structures, where they're located, hasn't been above water until before the last ice age. The very earliest they could be is 12,000 years old. Anywhere from 12,000 to 50,000 years old, the site could be, because it wasn't above water until then. Okay, so at some point it was above water, and then obviously the, the way that the Earth shifts, we've talked about polar shifts and other things before, and gnosis. So we're to accept that uh, humanity is only five, 6,000 years old, yet here's obvious, very obvious examples of construction, of architecture, of archaeology in an area where the earliest it could have been above water was 12,000 years ago. Okay, so already that tells us that we're already off with the model of our, our history, our civilization. Uh, there is, of course, no official explanation for this. The dive site, it's a popular dive site for tourists, yet there's no scientific evidence come forth to say why there is such an anomaly in the time here. Uh, the commonly accepted theory believe it or not, is erosion patterns. All those pictures you just saw were erosion patterns that are naturally occurring. Okay, never mind their hexagonal and post columns and roads and doorways. It's just a natural erosion. Let's forget about that and go on with accepting everything else. Uh, while we're on the topic of underwater structures that shouldn't be there, here's a very famous one right there as well. That's Bimini Road. Uh, Bimini Road is an underwater rock formation found off of Bimini Island in the Bahamas. Uh, the road consists of almost a kilometer long linear feature composed of rectangular blocks. This is in the middle of the ocean, right? Just off of the Bahamas. The blocks are as much as 9 by 13 wide, so that's a fairly big sized block, which of course would be very heavy. Uh, there's a picture of it right there, and here's an overview of the entire formation. Okay, the entire Bimini Road formation. You can see it's got the, the parallel features on it and the curve in the road. That's basically the whole thing, and that's about, you're looking at about a kilometer. Um, sorry, the, the distance of that picture is about a kilometer long, and you're looking at all the stone features. Uh, it had been, um, it was officially <coughs> discovered in 1968. People actually went there in 1968, dove down there and explored what was going on, although it had been always visible to planes flying over the area. Starting in the early 1920s, when, when people started flying over the area, they were always visible. Okay, they're always visible as dark bands in the ocean. It wasn't until 1968 that somebody went just to see what those dark bands are and discovered it's the remnants of a, a stone wall or a, a walkway or a path or something. A later exploration also uncovered two pavement-like linear features that lie, parallel to the, sorry, that lie parallel to the road. So once again, evidence of civilization, evidence of advanced technology in an area that hasn't been above water for at least 50,000 years. Uh, the interesting thing behind Bimini Road, this became famous because in 19, the year 1900, the famed psychic Edgar Cayce, remember the about Edgar Cayce, the sleeping prophet? He would go into a, a trance into the after the Akashic Records and make all kinds of predictions. He made a very curious prediction. In 1968, he said evidence of Atlantis would appear and it would be found in the Bahamas in 1968 or 1969. So he said that in the year 1900. Interestingly enough, in 1968, what was discovered in the Bahamas, but evidence of some sort of a civilization found beneath the ocean. Okay, once again, uh, the rock formations that you saw, the erosion patterns. You know, natural erosion patterns with the surface of the water and that kind of stuff. They've even done uh, carbon dating on some of the aspects of the, the, the cement that's used to join those blocks together, and the earliest that it could possibly be is 3500 BC, 
probably a lot older. Okay, but this commonly accepted scientific theory for bimini ro is erosion patterns, just like the same thing with Japan site. Then we get to the Baghdad battery. Uh, just a little bit of history of batteries. There was this guy, Alessandro Volta, that's where we get the measurement of electricity, the volt from, and he invented the battery in the early 1800s. The battery he invented was a crude, simple design <laughs> consisting of two metals which form the terminals, the positive and negative terminals. You suspend two metals in an acid which becomes electrolyte, and a current will flow between them as electrons jump from one terminal to the other. Uh, that's the way our modern batteries work. Okay, the only difference with modern batteries is we've been able to find better, more efficient metals and better, more efficient electrolytes. But the battery that powers your cell phone, your car, it's still the same basic design. Two electrolytically coupled metals suspended in an acid. In 1936, during an excavation in a village near Baghdad, Iraq, there was an interesting discovery that was made. Numerous terracotta jars containing a copper cylinder surrounding an iron rod with a bitumen seal over them. Bitumen is basically like tar. You can think of it that way. I mean, terracotta is obviously pottery. And there's a picture of it right there. Okay, so the, the white thing is the terracotta jar. Sitting inside that was the black thing, which is a copper cylinder. And the other thing on the end is the iron rod that was suspended inside the copper cylinder. The whole thing nicely sealed with a tar bitumen seal. Uh, they had no idea what these things were for. They had no idea what these things were for. They unearthed tons of them and had no idea what they were actually used for. Were they some kind of a decoration? Were they some kind of a food container? And then somebody made a discovery. And the bottom of all the jars was obviously a residue of some substance. What somebody did was analyze the substance and discovered that it was acidic. Okay, some, probably some sort of a citrus, like a, a lime juice or an orange juice or a grape juice or something like that. Some sort of an organic acid was found in all these jars. Copper and iron, interestingly enough, form an electrolytic couple. When metals form an electrolytic couple, that means in the presence of an acid, a voltage will be produced. Okay? The jars were actually batteries. Uh, the jars date to around 250 BC, therefore the batteries predate Volta's discovery by almost 2,000 years. Remember, this is a time period when we're supposed to be just, you know, not even working with real metals. Okay, we're supposed to be just getting involved in, in, in basic technology and basic architecture. These people had figured out how to make batteries. Okay, up 2,000 years before we started using them. Modern recreations of the batteries have been built and tested. If you follow Myth, Mythbusters, the TV show, they did that recently, and they work. There's, there's not a doubt they work. They don't make a very huge voltage, obviously, but you string enough of them together, you'll definitely get a significant voltage coming out of them. Uh, archaeologists have no idea what they're used for. So we say, yep, yeah, they're definitely batteries, uh, no idea why. Some theories suggest maybe they were used for electroplating, okay, to make put thin layers of gold on other metals for jewelry and that kind of stuff. But really we have no idea what the batteries would be used for. So you can ask the question, what would ancient civilizations need electricity for anyway? Why would they even need electricity? If you think of all the things that we use electricity for, they clearly didn't have, right? Things like you know, cell phones and cars and motors and lights and that kind of stuff. Then you go to the Egypt. Then you go to Egypt and you look at the Dendera lights. Uh, the Dendera lights, they comprise a three stone relief, so a carving on the wall at the Hathor temple in the Dendera temple complex in Egypt. And here they are right there. There's one aspect of them, there's the other aspect of them. And the things that, to draw interest to are these structures right here, the little Wires coming out, it's like a little lotus flower projecting this, this image with this snake running inside. Um, when you look at those, they can appear just sort of like some kind of weird lotus flower and some kind of strange petal and maybe a serpent. But there's another way of looking at those things as well. Some archaeologists believe those reliefs, believe those pictures you just saw, depict ancient Egyptian electrical lights. Why? Because the image that you saw bears a striking resemblance to Geismar tubes, Crookes tubes, and arc lamps. They're basically modern, powerful lights that we have. Okay, so some of our earlier light technology that we used, especially in the 1920s to the 1940s, resembled those pictures a lot. That seems like a strange conclusion to jump to. At first glance, it seems unusual. Why would archaeologists look at those pictures and immediately want to draw the connection between those pictures and electrical light? Okay, that seems like a strange jump. If you look at the pictures, and if you had never seen an arc light before, or a geyser tube, you'd think, well, it just looks like some weird snake thing. Why were archaeologists, or some archaeologists, 
so quick to jump to the conclusion that they must have been lights. There's a paradox that exists uh, with how the Egyptian architects managed to tunnel hundreds of feet underground and build complex structures without light. This is something archaeologists have always wondered about because a lot of the Egyptians, uh, especially the tombs, things like the pyramids, they tunneled deep into the earth, right? They went deep underground to make these sprawling complexes that went really far underground. They did all that without light. And I know what you're thinking right now is, well, they obviously had candles or some sort of lamps, or they could burn fires or carry torches. There's a problem with that. In every Egyptian site, there's a conspicuous absence of soot. Soot's also called lamp black, okay? There's a conspicuous absence of soot deposits in Egyptian tombs and underground complexes. You've all probably played with a candle before. If you need a candle in the same place in your house, above a ceiling, what actually happens over time? The ceiling goes dark, right? From all the soot that's accumulated. No soot deposits in the Egyptian tombs and underground complexes means that open flame couldn't have been used as the source of light. So no candles, no lamps, no torches, and no fires. Okay, the only other explanation we have is perhaps they use some sort of complicated mirror system to get sunlight and then bounce it all the way down underground. Okay, that's a really complicated method. An easier method would, well, what if they had lights? We already have evidence of the technology existing around the same time period that produced electricity, not too far away, and we get depictions of things resembling light tubes. So it's a possible uh, conclusion to jump to that they had lights. They had some way of generating light using electricity. Okay, so if they didn't have candles and lamps and torches, how did they see what they were doing? They had to use some other source of light. Yes? Mr. wouldn't it be kind of dangerous to use um, candles and torches and stuff? It's like this gas. Yeah, that's another problem as well. If they are tunneling so far into the earth and using a lot of fires and torches, then you start worrying about things like carbon monoxide poisoning. Because I need some form of air exchange in and out of the tunnels, absolutely. So that's one of the big questions we have about the Egyptians, is they went deep underground, but we really don't know how they illuminated it, and how they then they dealt with the, the gases and that that were produced. Um, and then you see that picture, and then you read about the batteries, and you think, well, maybe there's a connection here. And speaking of the Egyptians, uh, there's some really strange hieroglyphics in the Temple of Osiris at Abydos. Okay, that's what you're looking at right there. I don't know, but to me that looks, that looks a hell of a lot like helicopter. And then we have plane and almost like spaceship tank-like structures on the side. Okay, these are just, this is the picture as it's actually, you can go there and visit that yourself. Okay, that's a legitimate thing. There it is in context, at the top of the temple. This chunk that we're looking at right here, there's the helicopter-like thing, and there's the plane thing, and then the spaceship thing, and then the tank-like thing. So jumping back, um, oh, where are we going? Oh, get back here. There you go. Okay, so that's that area zoomed in. Uh, no explanation. There is one explanation. Do you want to guess what the explanation is? Erosion. Erosion, yes. Um, you see, it's eroded to be like that. Originally, it didn't look like that, but it kind of, this is like an erosion, and, ero and next thing you know, normal hieroglyphics suddenly look a lot like, and it's interesting because of the grouping of those devices. So if you saw a random thing by itself, it kind of looked like a helicopter, but how come the helicopter and the plane and the spaceship, how come they kind of look a lot like each other? Okay, and that's really weird that four things in close proximity would erode in such a fashion that they all kind of look like flying aircraft. Okay, uh, and that's a common thing. You can see that all over the place, and there's tons of people trying to explain and specifically how the erosion happened and things were carved and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that's not a hidden thing. That's right in that temple, anybody can see it. Now, I'm not suggesting, and people don't suggest that the Egyptians had helicopters and that sort of thing, because obviously there'd be tons of evidence of that, but they obviously had, or whoever carved this, had some ability to perhaps see into the future, whether it's visiting the Akashic records or jumping head into the Earth's history, and also had some sort of vision of technology, and then carved that into that actual slab. So, not saying Egyptians flew around in helicopters, but saying for a civilization 5,000 years ago, they sure did depict some strange images. Yes? What about the Nazca <clears throat> the lines that you can only see, the figures you can only see? Only see here in the air? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we know the same thing. They say it was a primitive balloon. <laughs> probably doesn't exist anymore because it, you know, eroded. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> again. Uh, and speaking of hieroglyphs, while we're on the subject of, of hieroglyphs and uh, Egyptians, uh, hieroglyphs were found in the National Park Forest of the Hunter Valley, 100 kilometers north of Sydney, Australia. Who's heard of that before? That there are Egyptian artifacts all over the northern part of Australia. Yeah, that's one of those things that nobody really hears about. Um, 
there's them right there. There's some of them. Uh, there's some more. This is interesting. Who's this guy right here? Anubis. It's Anubis, right? He's even carrying the ank down here. And there's some more Egyptian stuff, and there's an Egyptian mummy kind of thing laying on this bed. These exist in a national park in Australia, and it's not protected, and nobody wants to acknowledge that they're there. Part of the park was actually demolished, and the stones were, jumped, were dumped in the ocean by the Australian military for huh. no unknown reason, right? Because to accept that there are Egyptian hieroglyphs in Australia, we now have to rewrite the entire history of the Egyptian civilization. What are they doing in Australia? You think of where you know Africa is and where Egypt was and where Australia was, we're to assume that they were now had the technology to circumnavigate the globe in, in, in boats and ships and that kind of thing. Uh, the hieroglyphics are ancient, they're an old style, so they relate to the early dynasties of Egypt. They're not more of the modern Egypt we associate with the pyramids, they're actually a lot older than that. Okay, so Egyptian hieroglyphs evolved over time. Those ones that you saw there were in the style of the early hieroglyphs. Uh, it's interesting because the text, when roughly translated on some of the stones that remains, tells a story. It says they were here looking for the yellow metal, and while here the leader was bitten by one of our main poisonous snakes and died, he was buried here and his tomb still remains. Okay, when they first discovered the hieroglyphics, Egyptologists looked at them and said, no, these aren't Egyptian because we don't understand what they mean. It wasn't until later that another set of Egyptologists went back and said, it's not modern hieroglyphs. You have to go back a thousand years into Egyptian civilization and look at the old style of the hieroglyphs. When they did that, they realized they could translate what was written in Australia, which means it is Egyptian. Okay, without a doubt, the Egyptians were there and carved stuff and did things. Uh, what was probably happening, uh, if you want to look at it from a, a, a surface context, the yellow metal was probably gold. They were probably in Australia mining gold, which now we see the Egyptians is actually going to different continents and mining and gathering materials and then shipping them back to Egypt. As far as we're concerned, they have no ability to do that. Okay, so that means we have to rewrite the Egyptian civilization. Okay, it's interesting, and I put that quote there because there's different Gnostic concepts you could look at that. The idea of the yellow metal being, of course, an analogy or an analogy to uh, the solar bodies, and of course, talking about the reference of snakes and dying and all that kind of stuff. Uh, history and archaeologists have no explanation why Egyptians were in Australia thousands of years ago. They don't even want to acknowledge it to the point that Australia, that isn't even a protected site. That's a forest that's not even protected, it's not a national monument or anything. And there's a whole organization of people fighting to get the Australian government to recognize that so they can preserve the site. Because the site is open to vandals and people go and spray paint it and teenagers hang out there and you know, drink beer and that kind of stuff. It's not a protected site. One of the greatest mysteries we have of the Egyptians, but the uh, scientific community and Egyptologists don't want to recognize it. Because if they recognize it, they then have to rewrite everything that they know about the history of Egypt. So as far as we're concerned, there was no reason for Egyptians to be in Australia. Uh, then we get to the Antikyra mechanism. Uh, this was an artifact that was discovered in the year 1900 from a shipwreck on the floor of the Mediterranean. Okay, an artifact that was dragged up when they, they found a shipwreck, they went down to explore it, and they pulled up this artifact as a result of that. Uh, this artifact, for over 60 years, the scientific community was baffled as to what the device was made for. We had no idea what this thing did. It wasn't until recent advances in computer technology that we were able to figure out what this thing actually was. The device, the mechanism itself, was extremely mechanically sophisticated. <laughs> similar in complexity to our early forms of clocks. Okay, so clocks that we didn't have until a couple hundred years ago. That's a picture of it right there. Uh, you can see the front is one big main gear. It's a whole system of gears and wheels, kind of like the inside of a clock, and that's what it's compared to. It's, uh, it dates back to like three, 4,000 years old, and it's about as complex as clocks that we had a couple hundred years ago. And for over 60 years, scientists had no idea what this thing was. It wasn't until we had advances in computer technology and advances in digital imaging and x-ray and digital x-ray that we were able to actually figure out what this thing did. Uh, it be consequently became the world's oldest geared device containing many gears and flawlessly manufactured with a really high degree of precision. The device is basically an analog computer designed to calculate astronomical positions with startling accuracy. Okay, there's people that have rebuilt them from the digital scans and the x-rays, they've reconstructed this. 
Okay, and modern versions of this exist, proving how it actually worked. <coughs> there was a dial that you entered a specific date on, and as you entered the date, a system of wheels and gears moved to show the position of the sun, the moons, and the planets. Okay? Uh, it's over 2,000 years old, creating the earliest clock of over 1,600 years. Not only would you need advanced understanding of gears and gear ratios and mathematics, you'd also need a good understanding of, of course, astronomy and the relationship to the various planets and the periods and cycles the planets moved on. And this is coming from a time period, once again, when we're supposed to just barely be a civilization. This is a, a device that it took us with our technology in our day and age 60 years. It took the scientific community 60 years to figure out what it was and how it worked. We had to wait for advancements in our own technology to figure out how this thing worked. Okay, and it's pulled from a shipwreck that's over 2,000 years old at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, some more technological advancements, the Iron Man and the Iron Pillar. The Iron Man is a name given to an old iron pillar found partially buried in the ground in a German national forest. Uh, it's a square metal bar with basically almost a, a meter and a half above the ground, so about five feet above the ground and 2.7 meters below ground, about seven feet sticking below the ground as well. Uh, the earliest mention of this thing in writings, it appears in 1625, and in 1625, those writings indicate it had been there for centuries before. So it had been around for a very long time. In the vicinity of the bar itself are old aqueducts, systems for transporting water, and an ancient stone walkway. So in the middle of this German forest is an area that we really know nothing about. There's evidence of earlier civilization, and evidence that this earlier civilization knew enough about metallurgy to construct this, this device, this iron pillar. There it is right there. It doesn't really look like anything special, it's just a big chunk of iron sitting in the middle of the forest. Okay. The Iron Pillar of Delhi is a 33-foot high pillar that's found in Delhi, India. It weighs more than six tons and dates back to the 4th century. So this thing is over 1,600 years old. Uh, interesting enough, its composition is 98% pure wrought iron. And there it is right there, the Iron Pillar of Delhi. Okay? So, so what? So there's this big slab of metal sticking out of the ground in the German forest. So there's this 33 foot high, six ton column of raw iron that's sitting somewhere in India. What's the big deal? They're both made out of iron, who cares? What do you know about iron? We didn't have that technology at that point. We're not only were we supposedly not able to have that technology, what does iron do over time, really rapidly? Rusts. Iron is one of the most susceptible materials to rust. We have to do all kinds of things to prevent iron from rusting. We have to mix it with other metals and do everything like that. The really strange thing about the Iron Man and the Iron Pillar is despite their significant age, neither structure shows sign of any significant corrosion. Here are two iron objects that have been around for thousands of years and they don't rust. We have no idea why. Okay? There's people in India that still write theses on how the iron pillar is not rusting. People that study the surface with microscopes and lasers and try to get the exact composition of these metals down that prevented them from corroding. This is something that we're able to do in our modern times with different types of steels by adding uh, molybdenum and vanadium and chromium to the steel to prevent it from rusting. But this is something apparently that uh, ancient civilizations had access to. Okay, Whoever constructed these two devices, one in India and one in Germany, had advanced knowledge of metallurgy, had an understanding of metallurgy that we still get. And the riddle behind the iron pillar wasn't cracked until a couple of years ago. Somebody figured out the exact composition that was preventing this thing from rusting, even though it was exposed to the elements in the rain for over 1,600 years old. That would be like you putting a, a, a nail on your back deck and expecting 2,000 years later to find that nail looking exactly the same as it does now. Okay, imagine if they did that with cars. Okay, so you take like a four pin off from the 70s and you'll we'll have it sit there for 3,000 years and get it to start up and drive it away. A Volkswagen. Or a Volkswagen, there you go. Consequently, uh, those two artifacts, the Iron Man and the Iron Pillar, they've attracted the attention of archaeologists and metallurgists for a very long period of time. We're trying to figure out exactly how things, how these things were built. One of the other, sorry, one of the other curiosities about the Iron Pillar is it's forge welded. Okay, it's a forge welded construction. What we really need to understand about forge welding is it requires extremely high temperatures. Okay, you can't forge weld something with a wood fire. You need like, we start talking about like different kind of gases, oxyacetylene and stuff like that. You have to go thousands of degrees and Fahrenheit to be able to forge weld iron like that. 
Okay, you can't do that with a normal wood fire. There was no way to get the temperatures. So the people that built the iron pillar not only had advanced uh, knowledge of metallurgy, they had some sort of way of working with metal using a fuel that we don't know of. Okay, obviously they use modern materials today like propane and acetylene and stuff like that, but they apparently didn't have those back then. So how is it they were able to do forge welding, a process that we do today, but you can't get those temperatures by doing something simple like burning logs or something like that. Then we get to the Ica stones. The Ica stones are carved stones that were uncovered in pre-Hispanic tombs in Peru. One of the interesting things about these carvings is they depict a wide variety of images. So they're stones with carvings on them, and there's all kinds of different images. Images including advanced technology and images including dinosaurs. There's a couple of them right there. So that's a human writing some sort of a dinosaur thing, and there's a dinosaur eating a, eating a fish or something, and a pterodactyl, and all that kind of stuff. So these are these stones that they find that depict things that shouldn't be there. Things like dinosaurs, things like advanced technology, this picture showing crude surgeries and that kind of stuff. Uh, the stones are shrouded in controversy, like most of the things that we're looking at today. Some of the stones appear old and genuine and can be dated and tested as being original, but unfortunately there's many forgeries of these stones that existed. And the scientific community looks at the forgeries and says this is a forgery, therefore they're all a big hoax, so forget about them. But you can distinguish between the old original stones and the forgeries. One of the problems with the forgeries is their discovery was made popular in the 1970s, especially when Eric von Daniken released his book, Charity of the Gods. He made reference to these and they became really popular. So people started showing up in the area looking for the stones, and many of the local farmers decided to, I put it nicely, meet demand with supply. With, okay, there's lots of crazy white people looking for stones with carvings on them. We'll give you stones with carvings on them. Here you go, because people were buying them. So consequently, a lot of people started manufacturing them with modern tools. A lot of the locals in the area, it was more profitable to make these stones than it was to, to do other things. Um, then one of the problems that happened that further complicates the story behind the Ica stones was a Peruvian government discovered that basically the farmers were selling archaeological artifacts. So their response to that was they started arresting and imprisoning them. Because at the time it was illegal in Peru to sell archaeological artifacts to other countries. Okay, so the farmers were raiding these tombs and a lot of the farmers were regularly turning these things up as they were plowing the fields. They would discover these things and sell them to the tourists. Um, so if, the, if they were all just forgeries, why was the government involved? Why was the government chasing down these people and imprisoning them and persecuting them for selling them if they were supposedly just forgeries? Uh, consequently, many farmers who found original stones were forced to say, I made them. Because if you didn't say, I made this in my basement, you were arrested for selling basically national uh, antiquities. Okay, so that's something else that makes them controversial to this day, why it's really easy for the scientific community to go, forget it, they're all forgeries. Because some of them actually were, and some people that found them were forced to say, yes, I made this. Because if they didn't, they were arrested and persecuted. Many of the farmers that were arrested and spent time in jail when they were released went on to say that, no, they were real. That uh, now I've done my jail time, I can say, I didn't make these, these, these things were legitimate. So some farmers that claimed that they were making them later recanted the story when the threat of imprisonment went away. So an interesting story behind those things. And that brings us to talking about fossilized human footprints. This is another really curious thing that we see in history. Uh, one of the most famous ones is the Biloxi River Trail, and this is in the States, uh, in a park in Texas. There was a startling discovery made in what's known as the Dinosaur Park. The Dinosaur Park is, is it's kind of like the, the Badlands of Alberta for Canada. There's a lot of dinosaur fossils, a lot of discoveries in that area. And one of the interesting things about the Dinosaur Park is it's famous for its many trails of fossilized dinosaur footprints. When dinosaurs were wandering around that particular region of the world millions of years ago, the soil was of a clay-type construction, and a lot of the dinosaurs would obviously walk through the clay and make footprints. Millions of years later, that clay turns to stone, and those footprints are preserved, and you can go see the various tracks of dinosaurs. Then there was this anomaly that occurred. As more and more of the area was explored and uncovered, mixed with and sometimes crossing over the paths of the dinosaur tracks were the footprints of human beings. Footprints of bipedal, two legs standing upright with toes, just like we have. So there's your tracks of your dinosaurs, and over here were your tracks of human footprints. And that, of course, was a huge controversy, because as far as we're concerned, there definitely wasn't human beings around the time of the dinosaurs. 
History teaches us that the dinosaurs became extinct about 65 million years ago, at the end of what they call the Cretaceous period, and that humans appeared like 400,000 years ago from today. So a discrepancy of over 65 million years, right? But these prints were obviously made at the same time, suggesting a big contradiction in the standard accepted models of the Earth's history of life. So here's your dinosaurs and here's your people supposedly existing at the same time period. A time period that science tells us is separated by 65 million years. Okay, we can say from the dinosaur remains and their bones and we can carbon date them and we can say the dinosaurs were this period, then what were footprints doing then? Okay, there's two ways of looking at it. You can say, well, either maybe humanity's history does go back that far, or another theory is that the people that made the tracks might not be our ancestors. It might be a different race of humanity coming from a different place, and there's some people that even make the connection between perhaps extraterrestrial beings wandering around studying the Earth at the same time as well. Uh, here's pictures of them. There's some guy right there pointing to some, there's some here, and there's some along there, and they find more of them. These things are regularly vandalized. They're smashed up and destroyed on a regular basis. So there's a lot of efforts going into trying to protect them. Um, this is also, by the way, one of the unfortunate aspects of these footprints is they're a favorite uh, target for creationists, people that say the Earth is only 6,000 years old, because there's your proof. See, dinosaurs exist at the same time as humans. Humans are only 6,000 years old. Therefore, dinosaurs are only 6,000 years old. Therefore, the whole Earth is only 6,000 years old. Okay, so these things are popularly cited by creationists, which also gives them uh, a bad spin in the scientific community, because the creationists are all over this time of day. Uh, and it doesn't stop there. Let's keep looking at some more. A highly detailed footprint was found fossilized in clay stone uh, somewhere in Massachusetts in 1852. A large stone bearing a perfect imprint of a human foot, 14 and a half inches long, was shown to members of the Ontario, oh, sorry, the Ohio State Academy of Science in 1896. In 1938, some guy who was head of the geology department in Kentucky discovered 10 footprints in a type of sandstone. Okay, the rock in which the prints were discovered was estimated to be 250 million years old, and in recent times the prints have been destroyed by vandals. Okay, because a lot of these artifacts when they're discovered, um, people destroy them. Because it's easier to destroy it and make it go away than it is to change the entire view we have on the history of civilization and the history of the Earth. Uh, more stuff. Uh, in South Dakota lies a big uh, band of flat white limestone, which scientists was laid, said, hardened about 100 million years ago. Uh, on this big stretch of sandstone are three prints of moccasin feet, suggesting that somebody walking around with moccasins about 100 million years ago. Oh, there's more of them. Giant tracks made by human beings found uh, in the Alkali Flats of New Mexico. Uh, they're about 8 to 12 inches wide. The site was revisited in 72, 74, and 81, and more tracks were found. Uh, the oldest fossil footprint ever discovered, this one is really interesting, it was found in 1968 by an amateur fossil collector. The print appears to be a sandaled shoe crossing a trilobite. Imagine you're walking through the woods and you stepped on a bug, okay, and you squashed it with your footprint. Well, a trilobite is that, uh, you know what a trilobite is? It's that weird looking, kind of looks like a wood louse, kind of like a little crab thing that you can find fossils of them everywhere. Well, the trilobites are about 300 to 600 million years ago. And it's interesting, it's not just this footprint was found next to something else, this footprint was found crushing this object, suggesting that it was stepped on by whoever was wearing the sandal shoe about three to six hundred million years ago. Okay? You either say that uh, either we have to change the way we view human history, or we have to accept that a shoe-wearing biped from another world once visited the planet and crushed a bug. <laughs> Uh, this is an interesting one too. The imprint of a leather shoe was found in Triassic limestone in Nevada by this guy. According to micro photographs of the print, the leather was hand stitched with a finer thread than was customarily used by shoemakers in 1927. Okay, and that limestone is about 180 to 225 million years ago. Okay, and actually made such an imprint that you could analyze the stitching, and from the analysis of the stitching and the thread, I don't know, we have no idea what was going on there. Uh, let's look at some more out of place artifacts. For hundreds of years, coal miners have regularly been finding evidence of civilization embedded in coal deep within the earth. Okay, we've been mining coal for a couple hundred years, especially in a, a lot of the northern European areas, England and that kind of thing. 
Um, of course, coal mining involves tunneling down into the earth. Some of the coal mines went at really impressively great depths over a kilometer long deep into the earth to dig this coal out. And the ancient coal miners, you know, like a couple hundred years old here, they take pickaxes and they go down there and they, they smash up the coal manually. Uh, they would regularly find things like screws, nails, chain fragments, dishes, and that kind of stuff found embedded deep within the earth. Okay, they would regularly go down there and pull all this stuff up. That was just part of being a coal miner. You, you take your pickaxe, you uh, smash it on a part of the wall, some coal would fall out, and then amongst that coal would be a piece of chain or something like that. Uh, most of the Earth's coal deposits are hundreds of millions of years old. That's the problem. And let's look at some of these things that were found in coal. Uh, there was this guy, Frank Kennard, he was working in the municipal electric plant in Thomas, Oklahoma. He found a chunk of coal, too large to use, and he broke it open with a sledgehammer. So this is a coal-fired power plant, and they're going to throw coal into this thing to make it burn. And, oh, here's a chunk that's too big. So he grabs a sledgehammer to smash it open. Um, a pot falls out. Like an old iron pot falls out leaving an impression of the pot behind in the coal. So the iron pot was without a doubt contained within the coal, and there was a witness to this event. The coal deposits of the Oklahoma, sorry, Oklahoma mine are dated at 312 million years old. The only way the pot could have been found in the coal is if it was deposited there before the coal actually formed, and there's a picture of the pot. Okay, so that thing fall out of a chunk of coal that's at least 312 million years old. It's probably just erosion, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, more stuff. Let's see what we got here. In 1944, a brass bell with an iron clapper was found inside a lump of coal. Okay, the discoverer dropped the lump of coal and it broke open. The coal was found in a mine near West Virginia. The bell was analyzed by the University of Oklahoma and it was found that the bell was composed of a strange mixture of metals unlike anything used today or known to have been used in the past. And there's a bell. So that thing falls out of a, a chunk of coal at some point with a really unusual composition to it as well. It's not suggesting it was this advanced composition, it's just a composition of metals that we don't use and that we haven't been known to use in the history of metallurgy. Uh, in 1999, this is another interesting one, scientists from Bashkir State University discovered a large white slab weighing about one ton with a three-dimensional relief map of the Ural Mountains. Okay. It also, on this map, contains civil engineering works, things like irrigation channels, weirs, and dams to control the water flow, as well as a hieroglyphic, syllabic inscription of unknown origin. So we find this stone, with writing that we don't know what it means. The stone has a three-dimensional relief of the Ural Mountains, a mountain range, and it shows on this map how the water was being routed and diverted by some civilization using a system of dams and weirs and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, the slab and the relief, this is a curious thing, were not made by stone cut. So the slab itself wasn't carved into. There was some unknown mechanical means which fabricated this map. The scientists have given a date to the rock slab at 120 million years, and there it is. It doesn't really look like much in this picture, but the map ranges and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's uh, some sort of manufactured slab. And once again, this is one of those things that there's no explanation for. We have no idea. We found the thing, we can look at it, it's in the university, the people are studying, no, we don't know. We don't know what the writing is, we don't know how they made this, but there it is. Okay? Uh, in 1889, a clay doll, about one and a half inches in length, was brought up by a well drill from a depth of about 300 feet. So the well goes down, and they, they drill in to make a well, and then all the stuff that they're drilling out is coming out the top, obviously, and this doll appears. The strata, the area where they were drilling in, was about 200 million years old, and also from the same depth were brought up many small clay balls. Uh, the presence of iron on the surface of the figurine indicates that it had to be really old and could not have been hoaxed, could not have been forged. Many scientists who investigated the incident agreed that the figure is authentic and is really old, and there it is right there. Okay, the question that no one can solve is what was it doing 300 feet below the surface in an area that we can date to about 200 million years old? Okay, because remember, we shouldn't have been doing these things about six to 10,000 years ago. Not two million years ago. Uh, this is another controversial one as well. Uh, these, uh, husband and wife were hiking in an area in Texas and discovered a rock outcropping with a handle sticking out of it. So they're walking down this trail near a river, and they see on the ground there's kind of like a wooden handle sticking out of a chunk of rock. Uh, so they grab this chunk of rock with a wooden handle sticking out of it, and take it home and left it as a curiosity in their house. It wasn't until about 1946 
that their son wanted to figure out what this weird rock with the wood handle was, so the son split the rock open that revealed a hammerhead, okay, the actual head of a hammer. The area which the rock was removed, as well as the, the nodule it was sitting in, is from about 65 to 135 million years ago. Okay, a test was performed on the iron of the hammer, and it was found to be very pure with no bubbles, which is a hard thing to do with iron, and that's something that we can't consistently produce with today's technology. Another interesting thing found beside uh, the hammer embedded in this rock was fossilized shells. And there's a picture of the hammer itself, and that's what you're looking at right here. That's like a fossilized clam, and there's the hammer embedded in the rock. No idea how that got there. Okay, and that's something, unfortunately, this poor thing gets a bad rap, because the, uh, it's in the Creationist Museum right now in Texas. So the creationists are all over this, saying that, well, see, humanity is only 6,000 years old, and rock's only 6,000 years old, and you know, uh, sticking with the creationist model of the Earth. Uh, but it's a very interesting curiosity, because what we know about rock and everything, how, how did that end up there? Because that looks like a modern hammer, a lot of modern hammer, like from the late 1800s, early 1900s. What's an doing embedded in rock? And in the same chunk of rock, there's a fossilized seashell beside it. How did that even get there? What's the creation? Is that based on the Bible? Yeah, yeah they're basically so they're taking up. We, we were created 6,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah the oh, creationists okay. take the, the book of Genesis as a little history right, of mankind right. and tracing back generation to generation to generation. Yeah. The age of the earth is about 6,000 years old. Oh. So everything was created all at once. And of course, there's a lot of evidence that suggests the earth is a lot older than 6,000 years old. And the creationists just basically say, well, that was created that way. So fossils were created in the earth, the soul was created at the same time. And that's, they use that as a God's handiwork. Yeah, basically. The rock isn't millions of years old, and the earth isn't millions of years old, because humanity is only 6,000 years old. So if there's evidence of humanity in rock, and then rock is only 6,000 years old. Right? Kind of suggesting that everything conforms to our history. Uh, the modern estimate of the age of the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. And that's actually a fairly accurate estimate. This has been something that uh, we've been working on as a humanity for about uh, 200 years old, trying to figure out the age of the Earth. And based on modern radiocarbon dating and the relationship between lead isotopes and uranium isotopes, we can figure out that the Earth is approximately 4.5 billion years old. 4.5 billion looks like that. That's a lot of zeros. If civilization uh, if civilizations have only existed for the past 6,000 years old, if you do a little bit of a simple math, that means civilization has been on the Earth for 0. 0.000013% of the Earth's history. Okay, that is such a tiny fragment. That's pretty much inconsequential. To suggest that civilization has only existed for 6,000 years on a planet that is 4.5 billion years old, that's an extremely short, almost inconsequential period in the Earth's history. It's almost an irrelevant period of time. It is a humanity we seem so self-centered on us being the be-all, end-all, and everything having to go to, to our model, we forget that the Earth is, we can't even grasp something that's 4.5 billion years old. That's totally out of our, even our comprehension. Despite much evidence to the contrary, most scientists refuse to reevaluate the current models of the Earth's history of life and the history of humanity. Okay, and if you're familiar with the Riddle of the Sphinx, remember there was that scientist, and actually a group of scientists, they were trying to suggest the Sphinx was at least 25,000 years old based on the water and the erosion patterns the Sphinx exhibited and how they differed from the Great, uh, the great Pyramid, which was supposedly built around the same time. And once again, that's uh, basically a, a controversial theory because to accept the data of the Sphinx at 25,000 years old, you have to accept or re basically write everything we know about history and civilization. And yeah, and in about 50 minutes, we've just done a quick tour, and that list is not uh, not exhaustive. You can go on the internet and or read up on a lot of this stuff. There's a ton of information that suggests civilization has been around at least before the last ice age. If you forget the weird hammers fossilizing the rocks and all that kind of stuff, if you're going on things like Bimini Road and Japan's pyramids, things that you can't basically dispute because they're right there and you can go and see them yourself, then we have to push history back to at least 50,000 years ago. So not going back to 3,500 BC and Babylonian Samaria, but going back to at least 50,000 years ago. And recognizing that ancient civilizations had access to technology. Okay, things like batteries, things like electricity, things like complicated geared devices. These are things that our ancestors had use of. Okay, rather than running around with sticks in the woods, they actually had technology. They actually had an advanced knowledge of mathematics and architecture and astronomy and that kind of stuff. 
So all I wanted to do today with the presentation is just make you think of it. Just make you think and maybe perhaps uh, you know, spark your interest in thinking that uh, uh, everything that we've been told about the history of our civilization is, might not be what it seems to be. And then if you look at it from a, a Gnostic viewpoint, when we start talking about different civilizations, and you start talking about the different races, you know, the Atlanteans and the Lemurians, then you perhaps start seeing that some of these could in fact be evidence of different races of humanity, suggesting that the Earth has had numerous races before that had access to advanced technology, architecture, and that kind of stuff. Okay, there you go. Thank you very much.